Okay, well, hello everyone. Good afternoon. My name is uh, Jenny Baumgartner and I am a health scientist at the NIH Office of Disease Prevention and I will be your moderator for this afternoon's session. On behalf of the NIH Office of Disease Prevention, it is my pleasure to welcome you all to the Prevention in Focus webinar series. Our webinars feature talks from prevention science experts and thought leaders who are making advances in public health. This webinar series provides an opportunity for the broader scientific community and members of the public to learn about the latest prevention research findings directly from expert voices around the globe. So today we are thrilled to welcome Ms. Catherine Carty from Munster Technological University and Ms. Lindsay Lee from St. Jude's Children's Research Hospital to present their webinar, World Health Organization Guidelines on Physical Activity and Sedentary Behavior for Persons Living with Disabilities, Process to Practice. Um, Dr. Toyin Ajishafe from NICHD will introduce our speakers shortly. Okay, so before we get started with the presentation, I would like to go over some, some housekeeping logistics for today's webinar. All lines will be muted upon entry and will stay muted throughout the presentation. There will be a question and answer session at the end of the presentation. So please submit your questions you have for our speakers to the Q&A pod directed to all panelists. We will be monitoring these throughout the session. And please note that this webinar will be recorded and posted to the ODP website. All right, so I know everyone's very excited about our webinar. I will pass it over to Dr. Aji Shafe to introduce today's speakers. Take it away. Thank you so much, Jennifer. I'm thrilled to be here and I really look forward to these talks. Um, it's my absolute honor to introduce today's speakers on a topic that's really important uh, and I hope that we all continue to advocate and, and champion. Dr. Catherine Cardi leads the UNESCO Chair on Inclusive Physical Activity and Sport at Munster Technological University in Ireland. She is responsible for advancing the rights of persons with disability as aligned with UNESCO global policy. She leads an international consortium to promote disability inclusion in and through sports, physical activity, and physical education. She advocates for the sustainable development of the principle of no one left behind. Dr. Kari led a three-day session of this agenda at World Expo 2020 Dubai in January 2022, bringing together the UN and multilateral agencies, governments, the sports sector, development banks, and human rights institutions. She sat on the guide, guidelines development group for the WHO guidelines on physical activity and sedentary behavior for, for persons with disabilities 2020, where she chaired the disability subgroup. Dr. Carty developed the award-winning UFIT program to make the fitness industry more inclusive of people with disabilities. She sits on the steering group for measuring sports contribution to the sustainable development goals across groups including the advisory group of the Center of Sport and Human Rights, the UN Interagency Group for Sport for Development and Peace, the Global Action on Disability Network, among other prestigious groups. Ms. Ms. Lindsay Lee is currently working as an analytics solutions architect with the analytics services team at St. Jude's Children Research Hospital. She previously served as a technical officer at the WHO, where she supported all aspects of the WHO Disability Program, particularly focused on disability data. In her time at WHO, she contributed to the guidance on physical activity of people experiencing disability. She also worked on WHO's initial guidance on protecting people with disability amid the COVID-19 uh, outbreak in collaboration with other UN agencies. She also contributed to the development of the UN Disability Inclusion Strategy and its implementation at WHO. She completed her Master of Public Policy and Master of Science in Applied Statistics at the University of Oxford as a Rhodes Scholar in 2014 through 2016. Again, it's my honor to introduce both speakers and Dr. Catherine Caddy, you have the floor. 
Sincere thanks for that uh, very nice introduction, uh, Dr. Aishafa, and I'm going to share my screen to begin the presentation from, from Lindsay and I. Actually, I'm just going to just do that again to ensure I click the audio share idea. Okay. Okay, so thank you everyone for joining us today. We got a very nice and comprehensive introduction there, so I'm not going to say too much on this slide, other than we're going to focus on, on the guidelines and then on the specific guidelines around people with disabilities and look at the process that was used to develop the guidelines and the implications of that right through to practice. So, as was said, I work with Munster Technological University in Ireland and we have a UNESCO chair on inclusion of people with disabilities through physical education, sport, recreation and fitness. Um, we have quite a broad global brief and our role has been to support the inclusive policy actions of, of UNESCO and indeed work with other UN agencies who also use sport, physical activity and physical education to advance their agendas. Um, I have a background in physical education and indeed in medical science, including epidemiology around physical activity um, and have a particular interest in looking at um, people with disabilities and indeed other marginalized groups. So, Lindsay, over to you to add to your introduction. Yeah, so just so very briefly, I'm Lindsay. Um, I am currently working with St. Jude's Children's Research Hospital. But relevant for this presentation, at the time that these guidelines were developed, I was a technical officer in disability at WHO and served as kind of an internal WHO advisor to help make the guidelines inclusive. Um, so I'll, I'll stop there. Thanks. Thanks, Lindsay. So just in terms of what we're going to discuss in today's presentation, um, we're going to have a look at the Global Action Plan on Physical Activity 2018 to 2030, just a little bit as it provided the backdrop to the new guidelines. We'll then have a look at the 2020 uh, guidelines on physical activity and sedentary behaviour. Uh, we'll look in more detail at the specific guidelines and recommendations for persons living with disability, um, a little bit about the process that was used to arrive at the guidelines, um, as well as looking at target areas for advancing policy and practice in the domain of disability inclusion. Um, and then we'll arrive at some conclusions or action points that can be um, addressed to take uh, practice forward. And we hope to have um, a discussion at the end of our presentation today. So if you have questions or you think of questions during the presentation, note them down and hopefully we'll be we'll have time to address them later on. So, as I mentioned, the Global Action Plan on Physical Activity 2018 to 2030 provided the backdrop to the guidelines. And um, in 2018, the World Health Assembly approved this uh, Global Action Plan on Physical Activity and its vision to have more active people for a healthier world. Its mission was to ensure that all people have access to safe and enabling environments and to diverse opportunities to be physically active in their daily lives, um, to improve individual and community health and indeed to, com to contribute to development outputs, outcomes such as social, cultural and economic development. The target set out in the Global Action Plan was a 15% relative reduction in the global prevalence of physical activity um, by 2030, among adults and adolescents indeed. So the World Health Assembly approved this plan in 2018 and alongside that process of, of approval, they requested that WHO update the 2020, 2010 guidelines on physical activity. Um, so that was kind of the backdrop into which this, this took place. And a little bit of what informed that decision was that the key facts that one in four adults and three quarters of adolescents globally are not meeting the 2020, 2010 guidelines for physical activity. There has been no improvement in physical activity levels over the last two decades. And thirdly, there's substantial gender differences consistent with inequalities in participation across other areas such as age, disability, pregnancy, socioeconomic status and geography. So all in all, there was a strong rationale behind updating uh, the guidelines presented 
by uh, presented to the World Health Assembly that ultimately ended in calling for a new set of guidelines to be developed. Underpinning the Global Action Plan on Physical Activity as well was a requirement towards proportional universality was the term used. And this is an approach whereby resources are directed to those facing the most barriers. And in the case of physical activity, those living with disability experience significant barriers to access uh, to opportunities for, for physical activity. So that universal proportionality approach is applied to that cohort group and prioritizing those with disabilities in the development of the guidelines was a WHO priority. So we now have a, a short video. Uh, which I'll play for you on the guidelines. I hope you enjoy it. Thank you. So I hope you enjoyed um, that video and it's one of many assets that were created by WHO to promote um, the, the guidelines and raise awareness of the guidelines. We can share um, access points to the, to the guidelines uh, later on. So um, the guidelines were developed to provide evidence based public health recommendations on how much activity, what type of activity, adults, children and adolescents, older adults and subpopulation groups such as pregnant women and those living with chronic conditions or disability should do for significant health benefits and to mitigate health risks. As mentioned earlier, the World Health Assembly called for these guidelines and the process of development followed the WHO protocols. Um, a guidelines development group was convened to advance the guidelines and to look at the evidence around physical activity and sedentary behaviour indeed, and a variety of different health outcomes associated with that across a range of subpopulation groups. And I'll come to a breakdown of those later. Um, specific recommendations were made for various different groupings, but the primary audience of the guidelines was um, cross government policymakers, researchers, health services, allied health professionals and exercise professionals. So the key audience of the guidelines was not necessarily the public, but those professionals who can work and then translate the, the guidelines for relevance in local contexts or uh, regional or national contexts, and also use the guidelines in the development of programmes to support the implementation of the guidelines. Um, so that's a little bit of the context of the guidelines. So uh, Lindsay is going to take us through the specifics of the guidelines. Yes, thanks, Catherine. So yes, yeah, so I will give a very brief whirlwind tour of some of the, the guidelines, um, the recommendations in the guidelines. Um, so here we have a, a screenshot from the recommendations for children and adolescents aged five to 17. Um, and so one of the recommendations is that Children should get at least 60 minutes a day of moderate to vigorous activity. Um, and the other second recommendation is at least three days a week, um, there should be vigorous activity that strengthens muscle and bone. Um, so we can move on to adults. So here's a, a screenshot of the um, adult recommendations. Um, and really the, the top line recommendation here is all adults, and I will underline all adults, um, should undertake regular physical activity. And also all adults should limit the amount of time spent being sedentary. Um, and I wanna make a quick sidebar here just to emphasize sedentary is not equivalent to sitting. Um, the, the guidelines very explicitly and purposefully use the word sedentary because being sedentary means you are sitting or reclining, but with 
a low energy expenditure. Um, and that was a, an important aspect of us um, ensuring that the guidelines were made inclusive because there are some people, myself included, as a wheelchair user, who are always sitting, but that does not mean that we are always sedentary. Um, so just quick, quick sidebar on that um, sort of language that we used in the guidelines. Um, so there's also obviously recommendations here for, for how long and in what intensity um, physical activity should be undertaken. And there's some, some good practice statements here for the group. Um, and what I wanna highlight is it, um, the guidelines say that you know doing some physical activity, even if you can't meet the full recommendation is always better than none. And um, there's no problem with starting small and, and working your way um, up to, to the full um, recommendation. Um, so let's move to the next slide. Um, so, and so here are the guidelines or the recommendations for older adults. And really largely they're much the same as for younger adults. Um, so the top line recommendation still being all older adults should undertake regular physical activity and should be limiting the amount of time spent being sedentary. Um, good practice statements still the same. Doing some is better than none. You can start small, work your way up. Um, and also older adults should be as physically active as their functional ability allows. So the guidelines you know, recognize that not everybody is the same and the way that people do their physical activity and at what level um, really depends on, the own, and on a person's individual functional situation. Um, so let's move to the next slide, please. So as we've already said, so for the first time, these 2020 guidelines gave specific uh, recommendations for key subpopulations um, who um, were not included in previous guidelines. And these were subpopulations that are at particular risk of being excluded from public health measures, um, including public health measures related to physical activity. So there are recommendations for pregnant, pregnant and postpartum women, adults and older adults with chronic conditions, and children and adults um, living with disability. Um, next slide, please. So the overarching message, and, all, and almost you could almost call it a philosophy of these guidelines, is that everyone of all ages and of all abilities can be and should be physically active, and every type of movement that we do counts. I think the video that, that Catherine showed um, in the beginning really exemplifies that beautifully. You know, act, being active um, can look like sport, it can look like dancing, it can look like doing your household chores, playing instruments, socializing with others, you know, taking breaks, stretching. Um, all of those movements count and are important. Um, and this sort of message really underlines how physical activity is a, is a cornerstone of public health and it should be integrated um, into our everyday lives and not thought of as um, you know, a separate discrete activity that needs its own dedicated time during the day. Um, and you know, that sort of uh, really groundbreaking vision for what an active life looks like requires um, a, a system, systems-based approach to bring to reality. And that has implications for you know, how we design our cities how we you know, design our transportation systems, how we design our healthcare systems, especially how we provision uh, primary care, um, how we educate people. You know, it's a really, it's a massive um, shift in how we um, think about how physical activity should play into our, our um, daily lives. Um, so next slide, please. So key groups like people living with disability were targeted in these guidelines um, for the first time, but really as a, as a means to really underline the true universality of these recommendations. So we, we know for a fact that people with disabilities are rampantly excluded from everyday life. Um, and this is you know, no different in the realm of physical activity. Um, you know, in this realm, there's, there's lots of widespread myths that you know, maybe it's not possible for people with disabilities to be physically active, or they shouldn't be physically active because it's too risky, or it's too difficult, or um, or they need special medical oversight um, and approval to start to under, um, undertake physical activity. Um, and all of those are, are myths that that are not um, true. 
So the guidelines, though, for people with disabilities, like I've said, are largely the same as they are for um, the general population of adults and children. Um, but they have additional kind of good practice statements. Um, and one that I think is, is particularly important for people with disabilities um, that is stated in the guidelines is that, you know, there is no major, you know, based on the evidence that was available to us, there is no major risk to health for people with disabilities to undertake physical activity when that activity is appropriate for their current, you know, functional ability. Um, and they also say, you know, a person with a disability may want to consult a medical professional or disability specialist or um, or physical activity specialist for advice about what type of physical activity to undertake. But the guidelines do not say that they necessarily should. Um, and I wanted to emphasize that because I think that sort of um, statement gives autonomy to the person with disability to have control over their own bodies and trust them that they know um, what is best for them. Um, and so if you move on to the next slide, we have another fun little video. Um, and I think this video offers you know, some, some proof and some examples of the many different ways that people with disabilities can be active. So go ahead. So that's great. So I, I love that video. I think it's it's just tickles me pink. So now I'll pass it back to Catherine. She'll talk more about the process. Okay, so yes, we had a very defined process, I suppose, um, over a period of time to arrive at the guidelines. Um, and so firstly, first part of that process after the initial stages I mentioned to you before in terms of the agreement to establish uh, or to, to go down the route of developing new guidelines, a guidelines development group was established and there were approximately 30 people uh, in the guidelines development group from with representing a geographical spread around the world, um, all people considered expert in their field. Um, everybody was part of the main guidelines development group and many people then were involved in various different subgroups. Um, in our case, Lindsay and I looked at a, a, a disability, the disability group. Um, the group first had a face to face meeting in July 2019 um, and obviously the guidelines were signed off on in, in August 2020. So just after a year of, I suppose, physical and virtual meetings, the whole process lasted that time and there was a little lag to the, the actual launch of the guidelines following the sign off in, in August of 2020. But just over a year really in terms of the process and a very detailed and, and defined process involved in so the guideline development group had a mix of people really so kind of subject area or you know specific area experts policy makers end users of of the recommendations uh, regional sp spread as i men mentioned and gender balance across the uh, across the group as well um, so one of the first steps um, taken at the first meeting was to define the, the questions or the PICO um, that we were going to use across each of the different subgroups. So we reviewed the scope of the guideline and agreed on the most relevant uh, population, intervention, exposure, comparison and outcome uh, questions at that first meeting and I suppose in follow up to that first meeting as well before signing off on those PICOs to make sure we were looking at the you know, correct uh, questions, correct PICO for each population group. Um, we followed in that process the WHO guidelines, uh, our handbook for guideline development, which is 
gives very detailed guideline on, on process. And the WHO Secretariat coordinated this entire process, keeping the guideline development group on track from start to finish. Um, the subgroups met online um, for the most part, so we did have physical meetings uh, in Geneva in WHO headquarters, but we met multiple times online in the interim period between those uh, physical meetings to advance the work agenda and to, to um, arrive at, I suppose, draft recommendations. So the third part of the process was to look at comprehensive evidence synthesis um, and you know, undertake that and, and update that process. So we looked at existing reviews where possible. Um, and in the case of children and pregnancy, we had a specific set of, of existing evidence to review. Um, and for other groups, the scientific guidelines of the physical activity guideline advisory group um, in the US uh, were used and, and the phys physical activity guidelines for, for America Americans was used as the baseline and we built from that process to the any new um, systematic reviews that were undertaken from that period of time um, to to the date uh, that we looked at these in in 20 um, 2019 um, and then the, we came up with the draft guidelines and they were agreed by consensus of the group, which was good. It, you know, it meant we were we were on the same page and in agreement. So across all the different subgroups, across all the different areas of expertise and the different types of stakeholders around the table, there was consensus uh, that the guidelines and recommendations were what they needed to be. Um, so there was also on the draft guidelines, um, extensive public consultation was taken on the draft guidelines and that took a, a number of different forms as well. Um, so this took place in kind of March, April 2020 and the public as well as stakeholders of interest to the various different uh, kind of subgroups and independent experts were selected to review the draft guidelines. In total, there were 400 uh, contributions made uh, in terms of analysis or opinion uh, reflecting on the draft guidelines and, and making suggestions for those. Um, those inputs were collated um, and inputted into the system and any changes were made uh, to finalise the guidelines uh, following that process. And the guidelines were ultimately approved in August of 2020. So then the guidelines were developed, yes, in accordance with the handbook for guide, guideline development, and they were then published, disseminated and promoted and obviously continue to be, including in events like this that we're involved with today. Um, and indeed, we're I'm aware at this stage of many groups around the world who are adapting or adopting the guidelines for national or regional use. Um, and indeed to develop programs and other initiatives so as the guidelines can be applied in practice. So just to have a little bit of a, a more detailed look and well, it's not all that detailed, but just to have a look at, at what we did and the conditions that were assessed across the groups that we looked at in the disability group. So we looked at the eight conditions that you can see listed there. So multiple sclerosis, spinal cord injury, intellectual disability, Parkinson's disease, stroke, um, major clinical depression, schizophrenia and ADHD. So they were the kind of conditions that the evidence was derived from that we looked at specific to the disability group. And then the outcomes that we looked at were the risk of comorbid conditions, physical function, cognitive function and quality of life. We didn't look at all outcomes for all conditions. Uh, which is important to note, and the evidence around these particular areas was considered alongside the evidence for the for those without disability. And recommendations were extrapolated to apply to people with disabilities in general, as opposed to looking at these specific eight conditions. So that was a key part of of our process. Then we had a number of 
considerations to make alongside uh, the quality of the evidence. So obviously quality of evidence was important, but on, phys um, on physical activity where evidence was considered alongside evidence for the general population, the certainty of the evidence was downgraded uh, due to indirectness and the same happened in relation to sedentary behaviour. So both for physical activity and for sedentary behaviour, um, the certainty of the evidence was downgraded there just because of the indirectness of the body of evidence in totality that we looked at. But there were a number of other considerations that the, determined the strength of the recommendation that was made, um, be it strong or conditional, for example. And so first of these was values and preferences. And this values and preferences related to the relative importance assigned to the health outcome by people with disabilities. And, you know, when we looked at the values and preferences and all the work being done by a variety of different organizations around the world over a long period of time in relation to the provision of physical activity opportunities for people with disabilities, this was seen to be and known to be of high value and people wanted to have an opportunity to to participate in physical activity um, the public consultation and, and stakeholder consultation reached out to a lot of organizations of persons with disabilities and disability persons organizations uh, to determine you know their feedback and to gather feedback uh, on the guidelines as well Benefits and harms were considered. So the absolute effect of benefits and harms uh, and the greater the net benefit, the greater the likelihood of a strong recommendation being made uh, in the case of the guidelines. Resource implications were also looked at. Um, so is it cost effective? You know, is it cost effective to have and to implement the guidelines? Um, and also, I suppose, looking at that, you look at the, the opposing situation or is it cost effective not to have uh, guidelines for this population group as well? So really looking at, I suppose, the human and financial resource implications um, of, of the guidelines as well. Um, equity and human rights is a very important consideration um, in terms of the development of guidelines and, and recommendations. And reducing inequality is integral to the WHO guideline uh, development process. So it was a very important consideration. And it's also a consideration at the core of the Global Action Plan on Physical Activity, as well as other international action plans in the domain of sport. Um, so equity and human rights as it relates to the Convention on the Rights of Persons with Disabilities being particularly re relevant for this set of recommendations, but also linking into other human rights uh, areas such as the Convention on the Rights of the Child that also refers to opportunities for physical activity, leisure, sport, recreation, etc. Um, the Convention on the Elimination of All Forms of Discrimination Against Women. We do know the uh, intersectional barriers experienced by by um, some people um, exas exacerbate the, the barriers uh, overall. And indeed, the International Covenant on Economic, Social and Cultural Rights would uh, lay priority to um, physical activity opportunities as well uh, for people in society. So a very strong uh, kind of human rights basis for producing the guidelines there. Um, the acceptability issue was another consideration and the acceptability related to um, whether the stakeholders found these guidelines to be acceptable. And again, the feedback that we would have got through the consultation was important here, as well as the expert opinion of the guidelines development group in terms of um, acceptability to the stakeholder group, uh, i.e. people with disabilities. Um, the greater the level of acceptability to, to more people or more, most stakeholders, the higher the chance of a strong recommendation, basically. Um, the feasibility of the guideline being implemented, and in this case for uh, those living with disability, what is the feasibility of us being able to undertake uh, these guidelines? Obviously that overlaps with other areas such as values, resources, um, infrastructure, issues around equity, cultural factors and cultural norms, uh, legal frameworks in, in different parts of the world and different situations also uh, point to the feasibility of these guidelines being implemented. Uh, so that was a consideration in determining the strength of the recommendation. And lastly, I know this is written as evidence v recommendation, it's probably more the, the priority of the problem. So how much of a problem is the fact that we don't have guidelines? And Lindsay referred to that a few minutes ago in terms of the implications of, of not having these guidelines, I suppose, available to us. And 
in, in, in this case as well, um, for priority of the problem of what is the burden of disease? What is the burden of uh, physical inactivity among this population group? Um, and given that we have, you know, 1.2 billion people in, in the world living with disability, this is um, a priority of significant, uh, a, a policy priority of significant magnitude. So there were some of the other considerations outside of the evidence uh, itself and the evidence for uh, populations living with disability and the other evidence that was point, looked at uh, in terms of design, designing the re um, recommendations. So I think, um, you know, I'm not going to spend too long on these things. I think they've been covered a little bit already. So the emergence of the guidelines was a purposeful and positive step towards including people living with disability in mainstream physical activity initiatives. That was uh, something that we were actively trying to do with this and trying to increase the amount of, of work and activity in this space and aligned very much with the, the human rights approach that underpins GAPA. Um, there was a lack of evidence uh, in sedentary behaviour um, and then we had to extrapolate to people living with disabilities. So, and, and that's true for the other batch of evidence that was looked at as well. There could definitely be a greater quantum of evidence directly relevant to populations with disability to draw from. Um, and there is a gap there that needs to be filled in subsequent years. But I think we've made a very strong start in terms of that. Um, the use of inclusive language is something, and Lindsay mentioned this as well, that we were the whole group were extremely conscious of in uh, in producing the guidelines and recommendations, and and a strong recommendation as well that this should remain a priority for all stakeholders as they communicate the guidelines locally in their own countries and regions. Um, and as I mentioned, the capacity and evidence gaps still need to be met. We have 10 kind of areas that we identified then in the group. There was a reference on an earlier slide of a particular article on the disability related recommendations. And that particular paper gives a little bit more information on each one of these 10 target areas for in advancing inclusive policy, practice and research in physical activity and sedentary behaviour. So the first is awareness, and this really calls for targeted awareness campaigns to draw attention to the inequity that people with disabilities experience in relation to physical activity. We also felt that awareness needs to point to the interaction between the health condition, personal characteristics and the environment uh, to help reduce exclusion. And also, thirdly, I suppose, in that awareness uh, target area, we wanted to emphasise the need for co-creation of solutions with people with disabilities or that this is a co-creation process. So communication campaigns were also deemed to be needed and the communication campaigns need to be targeted and accessible to people with a wide variety of, per of uh, impairments through a variety of forms, um, formats and technologies. Um, they also need to avoid ableist language and sentiment and be universally accessible. Um, inclusive access uh, to local amenities, facilities and environments for physical activity very, being very important and anything that may help that in terms of technologies, new products, environmental uh, changes, supportive relationships, changed attitudes um, and safe and connected act active transport opportunities as well. Training, training and education opportunities to ensure that those working in physical activity would have the opportunity, would have the knowledge, competence, skill um, to work with uh, um, people with disabilities and to provide for people with disabilities through their service offerings, through their uh, policy initiatives uh, in their work. And that's something that goes back to the education and training sector to really ensure that the workforce has the skill set needed to deliver on what these guidelines call for. Um, Multi-stakeholder partnerships are critically important. This isn't the remit of one sector of society. That what will enable this to really take hold across societies and communities, it happens in different sectors. You know, it happens at community level. Um, it happens with, with the people who are going to deliver services. So there are lots of a broad range of stakeholders within communities who need to deliver and see disability differently in order to effectively enable uh, the guidelines and recommendations to be accessible and achievable. 
Uh, research, we know we need more research. We need disaggregated data to enable us to know where we're at now in terms of participation of people with disabilities, but also in terms of the research evidence that can inform guidelines and how guidelines can be refined for various different population groups within uh, um, the disability area. Um, so a lot more research needed in that space. Um, a human rights based approach, I suppose, is needed um, in the provision of activity or in, in all activity around disability inclusion here. So as all stakers know how to protect respect and fulfill human rights, including the human right of people with disabilities to participate in in physical activity alongside others and people having an understanding of their roles and responsibilities in relation to providing services in physical activity, be it in health or in community settings around inclusion of people with disabilities there. Uh, developing programs, a variety of community community based programs that have disability specific accommodations where necessary um, and facilitating choice. So as people have the choice of what type of programs uh, to engage with, increased investment is needed to make this a reality. And that's called for in, you know, across all global policies around uh, reducing inequality. So we do need increased investment to make this a reality and changing governance to ensure that I suppose uh, inclusive societies are are mainstreamed and action towards creating inclusive societies are mainstreamed. So there are 10 target areas that we believe if, if action is taken across those 10 areas, areas, significant progress can be made in terms of um, ensuring that people have access to uh, physical activity opportunities in their community and, and in the health sector indeed. I'll just quickly, lots of other policy agendas cover this equality and, and call for this need. So whether it's, um, you know, UNESCO, WHO, the OECD, UN Sustainable Development Goals, um, there's a lot of people calling for more action in this area for a long time. So at a policy level, this has been a priority and we need to see that prioritised more now at the research level and at the practice level. And we need to see that capability being built among the workforce to ensure that that can be a reality. So, Lindsay, over to you. Lindsay is going to take us through these next few slides. So I'll um, start to bring us to a close by, um, you know, beginning to give some examples of how the messages um, and recommendations from the guidelines can be brought into practice. And this um, one really good example is this uh, We the 15 campaign, which some of you may have already seen. So this was a, a, a campaign that launched at the Tokyo 2020 Paralympic Games, and it aims to you know, bring together a coalition of um, all sorts of sectors of society to end discrimination against people with disabilities globally. Um, so let's, we have one more fun little video. So let's, let's play that. You're such an inspiration. So brave. You remind me to be happy. I love that you don't let it get you down. Good for you. It breaks my heart. Look at you out and about. You push us all to do better. You are superheroes. Really? Yeah, we're superheroes, all right. We're getting the kids out the door on time. We push strollers. Io sono il passeggino. Be grateful. People call us special. But there's nothing special about us. We have more over here. Can house plants. Watch reality TV. <laughs> Pretend we're watching reality TV. That's a with two base. Get sunburn on holiday. We're politicians and lobsters. <laughs> Pension <laughs> advisors. We, we get, get married! We met on a blind date! <laughs> <laughs> and we can laugh at ourselves too. <laughs> we love our grannies. And our gogos. We pray five times a day. And no, I'm not praying for a cure. I'm praying for a new handbag. We swipe right. We go on first dates. And get lucky too. So why the pedestals are nice? And the pity tolerated. We're not special. That's not what it's like. Non è la nostra realtà. And only when you see us. <laughs> Wonderfully ordinary. Wonderfully human. Only then. Can we all break down these barriers? That, that keep us apart. <laughs> That's one billion people.
So yeah, so the, the, the campaign is not necessarily specific to sports, but just sort of came out of the um, sports um, arena, so to speak. And I, it, I think it exemplifies beautifully how really truly ordinary and mundane disability is. And, you know, us continuing to put people with disabilities on a pedestal or, you know, otherwise othering them, um, all it's doing is, is creating a, a distance and a separation that leads to segregation and inevitably leads to discrimination. And this happens, you know, in all aspects of our life, but um, and especially in public health and even more so in the realm of physical activity. And, you know, like, like we've already said, you know, there's lots of really false and really truly dangerous notions around um, phys, uh, people with disabilities and physical activity, you know, including that physical activity, it's not important enough for people with disabilities. They have too much else going on in their lives to worry about um, physical activity or people with disabilities are too fragile to undertake physical activity or it's too risky or their needs or capabilities are too specific um, for you know, a general practitioner to address. Um, and you know, the, these guidelines are, are a direct rejection of these myths. Um, and including people with disabilities in, in the guidelines, it brings global attention to the need for disability inclusion in physical activity. Um, and Catherine already said it, but I want to emphasize again that you know, the, the development in the development of these guidelines, people with disabilities, that that sort of um, subgroup was given the same level of attention as all of the other subgroups and the same level of scientific rigor as all the other groups. Um, even if you know there was less evidence for us to draw on, we went through the exact same process for people with disabilities as we did for everyone else. It wasn't just a, oh, it, sound, it sounds good for us to include people with disabilities, let's just tack them on at the end. It wasn't like that at all. Um, and I think you know the, the process of us, um, you know, and another, another thing I want to say is that you know the majority of the people that were the experts that were part of that guideline development group were not disability focused practitioners. But I felt, Catherine, maybe you agree, I felt a real um, shift in the room, like even just in that small room, us having them be, having disability be a part of this guideline development process, I think really changed people's perspectives in that room, which is only just gonna filter out throughout the, the globe across um, all the other work that these people do. Um, and I think, you know, that them in, being included in that way is really a means for you know the, the WHO and the global physical activity community to say to people with disabilities, you know, we see you, you are important, your health is important, you you have control over your own life and over your own body, um, you know what you need, and you're a part of this movement, this this be active movement, just the same as anybody else is. Um, and I'll just say, you know, on a on a personal level, I you know I mentioned I'm a I'm a wheelchair user myself, and you know being a, you know a very small part of this guideline development process, um, really honestly has had a profound effect on my own life, because um, I also I think used to buy into these these um, narratives about myself, and I would you know sort of turn my nose up at people who were focused on physical activity or or, or talked a lot about exercise because. It seemed like the world really, when we talked about physical activity, we only cared about, you know, like the athletes that we see on TV or, um, you know, if, if people cared about the physical activity of people with disabilities, we were only focused on like the Paralympians, like the elite people that most people will never reach that level. Um, but, you know, that like going through this process and, and honestly, like the images that you see in these videos really shows that you can be active and be normal like you can be yourself um and I, I left that process like really honestly feeling a lot more empowered and and self-assured and um you know that i can also be active i don't need anybody's permission um i can do activity and, and the activity i do doesn't have to look like everybody else's activity um and so really i'm i'm honestly you know much more active now than i used to be and i i very quickly um started to feel those health benefits. Um, so I just wanted to sort of bring that that personal um, perspective and I'll, I'll pass it back to you, Catherine. Thanks, Lindsay. I think that's excellent perspective. And I think it takes me nicely to this 
um, this slide, we're very nearly at the end. And just to say that the guidelines, you know, are there now and implementation is where the work needs to happen. And I think, uh, you know, as Lindsay pointed to, there has been a policy shift, like people really want this to happen and that people have recognized and policy has recognized that there's not enough action in terms of trying to include people with disabilities in practice. And I mentioned it earlier, but you know, there's that little bit of reluctance, that little bit of people feeling I'm not, I don't really feel completely competent in this area. So the, the reaction to that is to shy away. And what, you know, what we're asking is that people you know, delve into this area and work with those who are experts, including those with, with disabilities themselves in terms of engagement with, with physical activity. So in translating the guidelines um, for, for from the guidelines and recommendations to actually being useful in practice, often there is that kind of translation process or adaption and adoption uh, needed to the local context in which you find yourself um, dealing with local barriers and enablers maybe to towards physical activity, um, looking at that local capacity, who can help, who can support, who can drive this agenda and make, create more opportunities for people with disabilities to be active in their localities and engaging in local consultation with stakeholders, with disability groups and uh, service providers and organizations uh, in your locality and co-creating effective solutions that will, will work in situ. I'm not going to go through these. You'll no doubt have the, the slides will be shared. And that's just a little summary of what we said today. But I know you're probably keen to get to some questions. I've seen a few flagging up. Uh, our contact details are there as well. So I think at this point we might just stop the presentation and hopefully have time for some questions. So thank you all for listening uh, so far. Thank you, um, Catherine and Lindsay. That was I think I speak for the audience that we are incredibly um, inspired and, and appreciates and just want to extend our you know, gratitude to all the work that you've done in this space. So let's uh, shift to our uh, discussion um, section of our webinar. We have some time to answer a few questions. You see the emojis coming in. It's well deserved. Uh, let's see. So I saw one question come in. Um, as a reminder, please drop your questions in the Q&A pod. So uh, Stephanie would love to know as a faculty member in academia, what professions would you recommend or target to train in fitness exercise for people with disabilities? Let's expand the scientific workforce. Yeah, I, I, I can, Lindsay, I'll start on that and Lindsay, you can chip in on that. I, I think this is a broad range of professionals, some of whom um, were maybe not necessarily considered health professionals in the past. I think you've people working in in community fitness facilities, people working as exercise professionals in community settings and also in health settings. You've occupational therapists, physiotherapists who who provide opportunities for physical activity that don't always have to be in the therapy context, but can can, you know, can link into kind of more community opportunities, opportunities that relate to sport and, and other other aspects there. So I think the broad there is a broad range of professionals who need to understand the message here um, and be able to relay that message because we do know that first contact often with health professionals will guide some decision as in relation to whether or not to be active. But I think there are a whole range of professionals that could be very influential in terms of people's opportunity to be active at a local level. So, Lindsay, you may may wish to add to that. Yeah, I'm just, you know, drawing on my own personal experience again. You know, every time I've tried to go to like a gym, for example, which, of course, you don't need to go to a gym to be physically active. But, you know, I always every single person I interacted with was always like, oh, like, I've never thought about the accessibility of like the equipment we have there, or, you know, I used to try and go to the, the pool and I had to sort of teach the lifeguards how to use the lift and that sort of thing. So it's even those like basic, like all the people down the chain need to have some sort of basic understanding of like, like a, that people with disabilities, you know, maybe a exist B do exercise and, and see, like have a right to use, um, all the facilities that, that are available. Thank you. Um, yeah, I, I suspect we have some some interested people in the audience that appreciate that advice. 
Uh, so another question that just came in, this, maybe this is a quick one we can just get to. What are the most updated definitions on disability and ability? That, that's a, it's, <laughs> it's more complicated than it sounds, but so I, I will say at least from, from the WHO perspective, the WHO takes a, um, you know, the, the model of disability that is endorsed by the WHO is this, it's called a, a, a biopsychosocial model, which is um, essentially, you know, um, requires that if we talk about disability, we're talking about both like the underlying health condition and the environment that the person um, lives in. And so disability is um, what happens when, you know, basically a person with some sort of health condition or impairment is in an environment that is inaccessible, whether that's, you know, physically, um, communication wise, um, psych uh, you know, psychosocially, that sort of thing. Um, yeah, I'll stop there because it's actually a very complicated question, but thank you. I, I think an another key message that we looked at in the guidelines development was uh, the idea of disability being part of the human condition, you know, and that you know, most people through their life course will experience some degree of disability. So, you know, this is something that everybody is, is um, you know, that impacts everybody, possibly at different stages to different degrees of severity at, at different levels, but it being part of the human condition is a, is a very strong, I think, message around disability that doesn't segregate uh, people into different different cohorts in that respect. Okay, um, we have a few more questions that come in. It's hard to prioritize with just a few minutes, so I apologize. Um, audience if we don't get to all of your questions. Um, there is someone who is interested in pursuing a career in this area. She wants to understand the impact um, of fitness and nutrition on health. Um, she became a certified uh, personal trainer, a nutrition coach through the National Academies. What is the best way to uh, connect the dots or interconnect these fields and apply them towards advocacy in a possible future career? Um, I would take, I would, I would say that undertaking a program that includes um, modules, components on adapted physical activity or working with people with disabilities as part of that uh, program would be critically important. There are a number of programs at undergraduate and postgraduate level that touch on this topic area, but that don't necessarily provide a lot of opportunity for engagement on a practical level. And I think that that's a really important component to develop competence um, and especially where there are linkages with stakeholder groups in the communities or referred through the health system and um, they're really strong they provide a really strong basis of opportunity to understand uh, the needs of the population group and to develop competence and confidence at working with this group so if there are opportunities you know uh, to link in with courses and programs in that domain even in the area of micro credentials which have become very um I suppose popular in terms of academic offers at the moment that might give this individual who already has a degree of background the opportunity to upskill in this particular domain. But I think definitely building like linking in with programs that have that practical component, a strong practical component, ideally in different domains, um, would be really useful. And the only thing I'll add to that is, you know, someone that I um, uh, met during my time at WHO, she had a a personal trainer and she was someone who um, um, was like a, a wheelchair user with sort of a different functional ability and she had a Pilates coach who was just a regular Pilates coach but she said that this person was the best trainer she's ever had just because she just knew the body and could adapt like the skills that she knew about the body to the differences in that she experienced in her own body so so like Catherine said I think the, the practical component is is very important and the um the practical component I mean like getting that experience with this population is very important but also just the i the having um the ability to sort of be flexible in your own mind and to like have that adaptability be like okay well these are this is what i know about fitness and physical activity and how how does how does that um apply to um a person who has like different um, sort of physiological 
um, components. I, I, I'm not sure that made much sense, but it made more sense in my head. But <laughs> I guess what I'm trying to say is the, the flexibility and adaptability is, a, is an important um, skill. And to be kind of humble, you know, don't, don't, when you meet somebody, don't assume that like the way that you know how to do things is always the way that it needs to be done. Because especially with people with disabilities, that's just not true all the time. Okay, but we're looks like we're out of time. I'm so sorry. I didn't get to everybody's questions, but I see some some great suggestions pop up in the chat too to follow up with that last question. I just want to, you know, close us out and thank our speakers once again for this excellent presentation. Um, this very important presentation. Um, you know, a recording of this webinar, as I mentioned, the chat will be archived and shared at, on the website at our website at a later time. Um, this will also include those amazing videos that were shared today. So if you have any questions about the prevention and focus webinar series or would like to receive a copy of um, today's slides, even though they will be on the website, you can contact us at, at prevention and focus at NIH.gov and we will see you um, for our next webinar on October 26. Thank you again, audience and speakers. That was fantastic. Have a great afternoon, everyone. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you all.